Shots, the world's number one golf betting show here on VSIN and VSIN.com, the sports betting network. I'm Brady Cannon, along with Wes Reynolds, Nick Henyon, and Triv McKenzie are at the controls, Karina Howe and Rob Moreno, keeping the show afloat from down below as we get ready to take you through the next hour of golf betting conversation. Mr. Reynolds, Wes joins me here on the program as usual. I've had the 54 hole leader going into Sunday for two weeks in a row now, Wes, only to walk away with the second place finisher. Colin Morikawa gets me at the Workday Charity Open, Matthew Wolf in Detroit. Uh, can you see the battle scars, my friend? I absolutely can, Brady. A little beaten and battered, but uh, you clean up nice and uh, you're going to come back with a winner this week. I got a good feeling. And uh, just to your point, it's always hard to lose a future. I know you and both Matt had Justin Thomas here. And uh, look, uh, three shot lead with three holes to play. Bogey's two of the final three to open the door for Marikawa. But you got to give credit to Colin Marikawa because you know, you, if somebody leaves the door open for you, you still got to walk through it. And Colin Marikawa did just that. And just the way it happened, because Thomas loses the lead, and then he makes a 50-foot bomb putt on the first playoff hole at 18, and you're like, okay, he just snatched the victory right back from this kid. Because Colin Marikawa, we know, is a very young, talented player with a bright future, but that's pressure that he's never been under before and then to knock in a 25 footer right on top of that 50 footer that thomas hit really showed me a lot of metal about about this guy and, and this guy's guts uh going forward i think it's uh it's not uh, far-fetched to say what a bright future colin marikawa has that he's at some point going to be a major champion and maybe in relatively short order so uh, uh a heartbreak for thomas backers but uh Colin Marikawa, I still think, very much earned this win. How do you react to Thomas going forward? Uh, is this uh, some of his nerves showing uh, some fragility? Or is this maybe what doesn't kill you makes you stronger? And he's kind of building his resume going forward towards bigger and better things. You know, Brady, on Sunday uh, after the final round, when I was just uh, tweeting out some thoughts, I uh, had people kind of react to me, and maybe they were people that had Thomas tickets and obviously licking their wounds a little bit, like, oh, this guy seems to, like, give a lot of leads away. If you look at the numbers, he really does, and uh, when you take into Sunday's account, he's now 8 of, eight of 13 when he was the 54-hole either outright leader or co-leader. Look, when you're on top as much as Justin Thomas has been, this is a guy that's 27 years old and has 12 PGA Tour wins. When you're on top as much as he is, you're going to give some away. It's like the the oddest uh, statistical anomaly in golf. We know Jack Nick Nicholas, uh, the host this week for the Memorial Tournament, by the way, we know that he has 18 wins in majors. He also has 19 second place finishes. So it, it, it you know, it depends if you want to look at the glass full or glass half full or glass half empty. But you know, I think Thomas is gonna is going to be fine. I mean, and when you lead as many tournaments as he does, you're probably gonna give a couple away. Wes, uh, Victor Hovland now three straight weeks with leading the field in strokes gained tee to green. Apparently, we asked about it last week. Is fatigue going to be a factor? Apparently not. But now going into a sixth straight week, can this guy pull it off again? Yeah, and, uh, and I hope not. And that'll give away one of my plays for the end of the show <laughs> because it was kind of a damned if you do, damned if you don't situation, Brady, because I used Victor Hovland this week. Uh, he has led the field in strokes gained tee to green three straight weeks, and nobody has ever done that since the PGA Tour started keeping track of strokes gained stats back in 2004. But what's really noticeable is he still lost strokes on the greens last week. I think it was like uh, 1.2 or something like that, but he had lost over six strokes combined when you combine the previous two tournaments, Detroit and also in Connecticut for the Travelers a couple weeks ago. So his putting is still not there. It's still not great, but it's getting better. Yeah, absolutely right, Wes. And uh, what an exciting player. He and Mawaka, uh, Morikawa, the young guns, really is showing tremendous success early and often. This is Long Shots, the world's number one golf betting show on VEASAN and VEASAN.com, the sports betting network. Brady Cannon and Wes Reynolds with you, trying to learn from the Workday Charity Open and how we can transfer that to this week. Of course, the same course will be the venue, Muirfield Village, Jack's Place, Wes Reynolds. What did you do in your hand? 
handicap using one week, a practice round, if you will, and uh, transfer that over to now for uh, week two at Mirfield Village. Did you change much of anything? Does uh, We know there are some changes to the golf course, maybe making it a little bit more difficult. How did you approach it? Yeah, I really didn't change a whole lot, Brady. I'm still looking at strokes gained approach. I'm still looking at strokes gained tee to green, greens and regulations, scrambling as well, because you're not going to hit every green. So you got to be good at chipping. And uh, these greens are, are going to be a little bit faster. They're going to roll about 13 on the stint meter. So very similar to what we see at Augusta National. Augusta in the Memorial, probably two of the faster week greens on the tour uh, year round. So uh I didn't change a whole lot. I looked a little bit at, at the market where I didn't want to necessarily be a prisoner of the moment. And I didn't want to be a better because that's kind of a habit we get into as betters where we sometimes bet what we see last. So I skirted a little bit of the shorter priced guys that played well last week because they've got to recover not only for this week against a much stronger field, 57 of the top 64 players in the world, 17 of the top 20 in the official world golf rankings. So this is a much deeper field. And you really didn't see a lot of adjustments on the guys that that were successful last week. Justin Thomas essentially is the same price. Morikawa did drift a little bit downward, but a lot of those guys are the same prices. So it's like, they were the same prices and maybe couldn't get it done in a, in a, against a weaker field. Can they necessarily do it against a much stronger and stacked field this week? Uh, yeah, stacked field indeed, Wes. This is like major championship type stuff. Nine of the top 10 players, 17 of the top 20. And there's that guy we haven't seen since mid-February that wears red shirts on Sunday showing up this week in Ohio. Yeah, he is. Tiger Woods. Uh Five-time winner here at the Memorial Tournament for those that are keeping track. Uh, and I was I was uh, talking about this on some other recent programming. Look, I'm not going to say he can't win because if there's one place where he can get right and come off the shelf after a lengthy absence, it would be at Jack's place at Muirfield Village. I, I did not you bet him this week, but I think he's probably going to be competitive. I would see, you know, top 10 to top 20 uh I think he's going to come back. He's going to be very comfortable. And look, the last time we saw him uh, strike a golf club was at uh, the uh, match down in Jupiter, Florida. And we commented to each other on previous episodes of Long Shots. He didn't look like he had a bad shot all day. So you have to assume that he feels good about what kind of shape is in. He feels healthy. So, you know, give him the benefit of the doubt on that. But I think the price was right this week. I think anything 25 to 30 to 1 was going to be fair. Really, the true odds would probably be like 40 to 1, but no bookmaker is going to be crazy enough to put him at that price and even get more exposure. And we'll dive into more Tiger, uh, Tiger Talk in our next segment, the Tiger Tractor. It is now time to bring in our guest. We welcome David Bierman from ESPN. He's the deputy editor for sports betting, ESPN Chalk and ESPN.com. Uh, David, good to have you on the program again. It's been a while since we've spoken. Um, but I want to ask you, I asked Wes as well, it's different for handicapper, handicappers and bettors, not just a casual fan watching, oh, they're at the same course again. We pay close attention to the fact that the greens have been uh, sped up, the rough is being thickened, uh, some of the tee positions are different. How did you use the Workday Charity Open and transfer version A, if you will, of Mirfield Village to version B, which is this week for the memorial? Sure, and that's a great question. Thanks for having me on. I always love hearing the program and, and talking golf. we got live action, so that's good. A great point about seeing the same course twice in a row, and it's not something we're used to seeing, so everything is taken with a grain of salt of what you saw last week for this week. I'm using some of the same guys, but I will say that watching – and learning and seeing how people attacked the course last week and the fact that the green, that the rough is going to be longer, the greens are going to be faster. There are certain guys that I'm not going to take this week because of what I saw last week, and that would be guys like Hideki Matsuyama, who always plays well there, and I had him last week as a top 10, which he had until the back nine on Sunday. The guy couldn't make a putt at all. He had a seven-foot eagle putt. He had a couple of short birdie putts. Couldn't make them bogeyed a couple of the par fives and if the greens are going to be even faster and it's going to be harder to scramble with the thickness of the rough i'm just not going to take a shot at him this week even though he's a guy who's done well at jackson and i just didn't like what i see 
Uh, Justin Rose is another one of those guys. I had him as my top play last week. And it's one thing if you have your top play, and it's probably not good to say that about a guy who finished about 140, 40th last week, but he was just <laughs> dread awful. And he hasn't played that much in his return to the tour. And it showed last week where, you know, you expect a guy who is a, a pro's pro like Justin Rose to just be able to get back on the bike and, and do it again. But he was bad. I mean, if you, if you watched him last week, couldn't find a fairway, couldn't get a green, couldn't putt. I mean, you don't just finish 142nd by accident. So watch him go out there and win it this week, a week after you say he's going to win it at the same course. But he's a guy that I'm also not going to play this week because of what I watched and witnessed. And right in front of your eyes, you're watching him play that course, and he couldn't hit anything. And maybe it was a bad week or didn't sleep well or who knows. But um, when you see something that bad, you just stay away from it the next week. David, I'm an avid reader of your column at ESPN uh, Chalk, and for those that have not read the column, David, Chris the Bear Felica, Doug Kazarian, Anita Marks, and uh, and company post their picks and their analysis for every PGA Tour event uh, each week, and obviously topic A this week is going to be the return of Tiger Woods, the PGA Tour action for the first time since uh, the Genesis uh, Invitational out at Riviera in mid-February. He's Priced at 25 to 1, uh, pretty much is the consensus mark on Tiger this week. And I'm curious your thoughts, David, and also your your panel at ESPN Chalk, uh, what you make of Tiger's chances this week. Sure. It, it, first of all, it's, it's exciting just to have him out there. I heard uh, heard you guys before you had me on talk about wearing the red shirt and, you know, call me a dork, but I wear the red shirt on Sunday when Tiger plays just because it's something <laughs> I've been watching for, for 20 some odd years. So if I go out there and play, I'm going to be wearing the red for, for just because he's wearing the red, just so I can pretend that, you know, I'm just as good as he is. Um, as far as what to make of Tiger, I mean, Michael Collins and the, and the golf experts on, on our, um, golf page had had a really good round table this morning about what to expect. And I mean, the opinions vary. Uh, you know, there are some people who think, well, he's played here five times. He's as well rested as anybody. So why couldn't he win valid? Uh, he looked very, very good during a charity event with Peyton, Tom and, and Phil charity event. Wasn't really a, an event, you know, wasn't one that, that counted on tour. Um, and he's had longer rest than people actually know. Like he was actually out before COVID hit. He had already been passed up on on Arnie's event because he was hurt. So I am actually taking a pass on Tiger this week. I do think you are right about his odds. I think they're all right where they should be. You don't really want to take Tiger at some books at 20. That's way too low. And you're right. They're never going to put them at 40 because they just can't put Tiger with at 40. It'll be 20 in five minutes. Um, I'm not taking him to win. I do think he'll survive the weekend and, and be there at the end, but you just don't know what you're going to get over the weekend. Say he makes the cut and he's six or seven shots back entering Sunday. Is he going to be trying to win? Or is he going to be trying to fine tune his game because he's too far back? You just don't know what you're going to get with a first event from Tiger. Although in the past he has proven that he can win off of layoff. He's older than he was before. We really don't know what's going on with the back. I did like what I saw in the charity event, and it wouldn't surprise me at all to see him in the top 10 of the leaderboard come Sunday. I just don't expect him to win it this week. David Bierman is our guest. He's the deputy editor for sports betting at ESPN Chalk and ESPN.com. You can follow him on Twitter at D Bierman ESPN. David, you mentioned uh, studying last week's event at the same golf course, of course, uh, Mirfield Village, that you're not interested in backing Justin Rose or Hideki Matsuyama this week. Uh, how about some players that you are interested in backing this week? Any top 10 finishes, top 20 outright market, head to head matchups? that you already have in pocket or are considering playing? Sure. There was a guy that uh, I'll start with the longest odds guys. I played Kevin Streelman last week at 65 to one and, and cashed on a two and a half to one top 20. Streelman played very, very well. He was right in the mix right till the end last week. And he also finished T2 the week before at, at the event the week before in Cromwell. So he's a guy that's playing very, very well. And he's had success here at your field with a proven history of four top tens, including a fourth place finish last year and seventh place last week at the same course you're getting longer odds on him this week and the explanation is obviously the field is a lot tougher this week than last week there's you know it, it's a much more stacked field so him being 70 to 1 and 3 to 1 for a top 20 is something i was excited to see longer odds than i had last week when i was excited about it on the shorter side of things i almost pulled the trigger last week on patrick cantlay he, I, I was not real worried about the miss since he really wasn't contending until he boomed and shot a 65 on Sunday. 
he's a guy that, you know, when you're looking at, at the odds for the entire event, you know, oh, well, I can't lay 13, 14, 15 to 1. Odds are short, but he also won the thing last year, finished seventh last week. And he also, by the way, in his last six top, last six events and full field events, has made the top 20 in every single one of them. So he's somebody who has finished high in almost every event he has played last year. And the metrics line up as well for Patrick as he's seventh on tour in shots gains Tita Green, which she was second when he won last year. And the champion, Jason Dufner, led the field in that in 2016 when he took home the trophy. So I expect Cantley to at least match what he did last week. Top 10, you can get him at 2-1. to one. He's done it almost every single week on tour. And if you can get a good price at 15 or 16-1, to one, I would sprinkle some on that. So those are two of the guys I'm thinking of. And just to give you two more that pop out there, sometimes, guys, when you look at this and, and you ask right off the bat how you compare last week to this week, Sometimes it's not it's not rocket science. You have a guy who destroyed the field last week and played better than everybody else and won it in Colin Morikawa. You're still getting him at twenty to one. Uh, obviously, you missed the thirty three to one. And I know you're not a fan, Brady, as he uh, you had Justin Thomas <laughs> last week. But for the most part, Morikawa has dominated the field that he's been in. And even though it went to a player, he had a bad Saturday, and Thomas took the lead. For the most part, it looked like for two rounds, he was playing a different course than everybody else was. I know Thomas got hot over the weekend and then went into a playoff and for all intents and purposes, and, and it pissed Brady off, but Thomas should have won the event. But all this guy does is make cuts and contend. He already has a win and a runner-up finish since the tour returned. We know about the made cut streak. He's made the cut in all but one event as a pro. So why not take him at 20-1 to 1, saying, all right, I missed the 33-1 to 1 last week, but you can still get him at a good 20-1 to 1 price. One other guy I was looking at, and, and you'll see it in the column tomorrow, you don't see him in anybody's expert picks on any website. Uh, the odds are a lot longer than I expected them to be, and we're talking about a guy who finished as a winner at Colonial, a T3 at Harbortown, took the last three weeks off, and what has he done in his five last five starts, all top tens? I'm talking about Daniel Berger. You can get it four to one to finish in the top ten, 33 to one to win the entire event, and nobody is talking about him just because he hasn't. Maybe it's because he hasn't played the last three weeks. Maybe everybody's talking about Brandel Chambly and Morikawa and guy Tiger Woods is back. You're going to get 33 up to one on a guy who's already won, finished T3 the week afterwards, and all he's done is finish in the top five and his last couple of events. So looking at that at 33 to one, that's someone that I'm going to try to play. I'm going to play him in matchups. I'm going to play him maybe even be the first round leader. David, uh, taking a brief detour here from the Memorial Tournament this week, we're just three weeks away from the PGA Championship at Harding Park in uh, San Francisco. Uh, anybody that you've bet early or any thought, early thoughts on the event and maybe uh, what type of player the course at Harding Park is going to favor? It was actually funny because I read your text message early this morning. You said we're three weeks away. I was like, really, already? We're here, San Francisco? We're ready for a major? And then I realized... We've already missed two majors, and this week would have been the bridge. So, yes, we're long mm -hmm. overdue for a major. Uh, it looks to me like it's going to be a, a hit, you know, a good ball strikers course. They said the, the rough is really, really thick. I've spoken to a couple of people who have played it because it is a public municipal course that they're playing the PGA Championship on. So I'm going to look for guys who, who strike the ball well, and I'm going to start with the guy I've already taken. I got him at 21-1 to 1 earlier this year in Webb Simpson. The guy has played well on every single course. He's a great ball striker. He's going to have his straight and fairly long. This is the type of course that isn't long from top to bottom, but is very, very narrow and has a lot of large trees that hang over the fairways. It's a shot shaping course. And Webb Simpson is a guy who can shape his shots as you've seen the last couple of weeks. He's not going to go ahead and bomb it 350 yards down like a Bryson DeChambeau would or Brooks Kepka, but he is a guy who I think can shape a lot of shots. Kept is another guy where, you know, if, if I go ahead and say, hey, I like the two-time defending champion, they'd be like, duh. But nobody's really <laughs> taking Kepka because he hasn't done well, and he's 40-1 to 1 this week. But it would have surprised anybody if Kepka shows up and he's in contention on Sunday at a major. No, that's what he does, and this is the type of course that he can get out there and shape shots as well. And there's no one 
who has handled the pressure of a major better than Brooks Kepka over the last three to four years. So those are a couple of guys I'm looking at. I wouldn't be surprised to see Morikawa, who's obviously in show and his iron play has been very, very well recently. The Shambo worries me a little bit just because he's turned into such a power player and maybe he can go back to his old style of hitting great irons. But this is not a course that you're going to hit it 350 yards and hope it lands in the fairway. Because if you miss, you're in a lot of trouble at this course. They're growing the rough really thick. And they, from what I've read and heard, the fairway is going to be 60% of the size that they normally play. So you've got to hit those fairways and those greens to score here. Looks like we might have a U.S. Open on our hands uh, at Harding Park in San Francisco. Great to talk with you, as always, David. Uh, enjoy the memorial this week, and uh, we'll talk some golf again down the road. Thanks, guys. I appreciate having me on, and uh, good luck with your picks. Absolutely. Thanks, you too. That is David Bierman. He's the deputy editor for sports betting, ESPN Chalk and ESPN.com. Uh, his column comes out, uh, I believe he said on Wednesday. So look for that. And uh, you can catch up on uh, Chris Felica's picks, also a friend of ours and guest at Long Shots. Wes, uh, Bryson DeChambeau's name came up there, a guy we have not talked about yet. And uh, Tiger Woods also returns to action at the Memorial. The next segment is our Tiger Tracker. And we'll dive into Mr. Woods a little further and See if maybe uh, Wes has anything on his mind for Big Bryson DeChambeau as well. When we return right here on Long Shots on VEASAN and VEASAN.com, the sports betting network. Woods is back. Wes, we figured he'd return this week at the Memorial. We also guessed he'd probably be posted at around 20 to 1, and actually he's listed at 25 to 1. Is that juicy enough for you to back the big cat this week, or do you still think he's going to be shaking off a little rust? I think it's a fair price, and, and I think, look, anything 25 to 30 probably was going to be fair. And look, the books are, are probably taking a little bit of a stand this week uh, because the tax in the price that you usually get with Tiger, even at a place where he's won five times like this week at Muirfield Village, the tax is not going to be as heavy as you would pay if it was a major championship, I think. Because, look, even though we, we are limited in terms of the sports menu right now and the handle – for an average golf event is going to be higher than maybe it would be over the previous year, in spite of the fact, as David Bierman mentioned, this was supposed to be the week of the Open Championship, but it's still the week of a big tournament with the Memorial. But the handle is not going to be, even at an event like the Memorial, what it's going to be for the PGA in three weeks or what it's going to be for a major championship. So the tax that you pay in the in the price on a futures board on Tiger Woods is not as big for an event like this as it will be for the Masters or for the PGA or even the U.S. Open. So I think that's a fair price. Uh, I did not bet him this week. I did not fade him either in any matchups. Uh, I could maybe sponsor Tiger as like a top 20 or an outside shot at a top 10. And in talking about that uh, on some of the other VEASAN programming, that's kind of the conclusion I reached in talking with some other people that, look, he's not going to play poorly, but it still might be a little bit too big of a leap to say he's just going to win. If there's a place where he can do that, it certainly would be here. So uh, I'm not really a buyer nor necessarily a seller this week on Tiger Woods. How about the power pairing that they came out with? This ought to be fun to watch for the first couple days, Thursday and Friday. Tiger will be paired with Brooks Kepka and Rory McIlroy. Do you feel that pairing benefits or hinders anybody, any of the three of them, mentally or physically? We know from years past, when you were paired with Tiger, that would scare the you-know-what out of you. Uh, obviously, these three guys are uh, very accomplished, major championship, number one uh, player in the world, ranked guys. Is it going to affect any of them, uh, good or bad? I don't think it should. Uh, 
really in terms of the negative. I, I think, look, Rory's the number one player in the world for a reason. I know he hasn't won since we've come back for, for the restart and play. Uh, and, and Brooks Kepka is now a multiple-time major champion. So these guys should be able to handle the pressure. Really, the scuttlebutt amongst golf Twitter and golf betting Twitter this week was that they were hoping that the memorial uh, uh, pairings would have uh, – Brooks Kepka and Bryson DeChambeau in the same group because we know Brooks <laughs> yeah. uh, took a little shot, took a little shot at him uh, a couple weeks ago after he won in Detroit. So maybe a little bit of a rivalry. And look, uh, both of these guys aren't afraid. And I'm speaking of Brooks and Bryson aren't afraid to wear the black hat. They aren't afraid to talk a little smack. They're both a little cocky. You know, a little arrogant about their games. And why shouldn't they be? Because they're both two of the better players in the world. But we were kind of hoping maybe that they would be paired together, you know, to see a little tension perhaps on Thursday and Friday at Muirfield Village. But I'm never going to whine and complain or piss and moan about a Tiger Woods, Brooks Kepka, Rory McIlroy threesome. No, I hear you, man. It should be great TV. And uh, maybe we'll get to see DeChambeau and Kepka paired together over the weekend. Uh, what about Tiger? Are we only going to see him one time before the PGA? Is there any scenario in your mind, Wes, that could lead to Tiger teeing it up again, either next week in Minnesota or the following week at the WGC Memphis uh, before he goes to San Francisco? I certainly couldn't see Memphis because simply that's the week before a major. Tiger Woods is not a fan of playing the week before majors. He likes to practice on his own, go back to Windermere, wherever he is, and and do some fine-tuning on his game, which is kind of the opposite of Phil Mickelson, who always liked to have competition uh, the week before a major. Uh, so I don't see him going to hot, muggy Memphis the first week of August uh, when he's going to the Bay Area the next week. And uh, the 3M, he's never played that event. It's only in its second year on tour. So this is probably going to be it for him. We'll see if maybe he does, you know, get into some sort of rhythm this week and he's feeling good, like, I want to tee it up again or I need to work on something. And maybe maybe he enters uh, the 3M Open in Blaine, Minnesota. That would be a nice surprise for those folks up there. We'll come back and talk about the first major of the year. The PGA Championship is on schedule in San Francisco to tee up on August the 6th. Keep it here on Long Shots on VEASAN and VEASAN.com. A course the highest in each factor is Valley High Golf Club, a tropical golf course paradise located on the Las Vegas Strip and in the shadows of some of the most famous hotels in the world. At Valley High, designed by award-winning architects Brian Schmidt and Lee Curley, you will find hundreds of mature palm trees, lagoon-like water features, beautiful bunkering, and a stunning clubhouse home to Sealy Restaurant and an indoor-outdoor patio experience and event space. The, blue, the course offers Bluetooth technology, caddies upon request, jello shots, model-like beverage card staff, VIP service from curb to course and back again, high-quality food and beverage, and a par-3 challenge where you can double your money with one swing. The stunning Valley High Golf Club, located in the heart of the Las Vegas Strip, is a golf jackpot, and there are money reasons why. Play today. To learn more about the Valley High experience or reserve your tee time, call 888-427-6678 or visit valleyhighgolfclub.com. That's B A L I. H-A-I golfclub.com. It is indeed our major implications segment where we take a look at the next major on the calendar. The next major on the calendar will be the first one of the year. And Wes, with it coming up so soon, just three weeks away now, we saw it with Bryson DeChambeau winning. He immediately had his odds adjusted, became the favorite in every major throughout the rest of the year. And now the same uh, happens to Colin Morikawa after he gets it done at the Workday Charity Open. Now 30-1. to one to win the PGA Championship, the U.S. Open, and the Masters. 
can you get behind? I mean, this guy now has two wins uh, in his young career. Uh, I believe he's 23 years old. Correct me if I'm wrong there, but can you get behind a guy at 30 to one that is so young in his career to go to that next level and win a major championship? Look, it wouldn't be necessarily unprecedented, Brady. It was just a few years ago that Jordan Spieth was in his very early right. 20s and uh, and winning majors. And I think that that price at 30 to one on Morikawa, probably when you look at the ball striking statistics and the fact that he's up high in greens and regulation and strokes gained approach and strokes gained tee to green. And those are really important statistics pretty much every single week uh, in the game of golf and especially out on the PGA Tour. I think... You know, thirty to one is is probably very fair on Colin Marikawa, and he's he's pretty much when you look at the range of players at the PGA that are priced really in the similar era or area, you know that Bryson and Rory and Brooks Kepka and Justin Thomas and John Rahm and DJ and Tiger are going to be priced shorter. So he's in that range probably at thirty to one, where like a Webb Simpson is, or where potentially a Justin Rose is, and Justin Rose may drift up if he plays like he did last week, as uh, David Bierman pointed out. But he's going to be kind of priced in that group with Simpson and Cantlay and Xander Schauffele and maybe a couple other guys. Their odds can uh, shorten a little bit if they start playing better. But I think that that's absolutely the right price for him. And plus, he did play at Cal. He is a Cal Golden Bear. So There you go. Good you know, point. Good he's probably. I'm sure he's probably played Harding Park before, or at least at some point in his young career. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I think it's a right price, and I think it's a fair price. And uh, he absolutely can be a winner here. Uh, I think he's going to win a major, I think, in short order. Now, how short of an order? We don't know. But I think he's on the cusp of something pretty big graduating to some uh, pretty heavy company there early in his career. Webb Simpson, Patrick Cantlay, Colin Morikawa, now in that same conversation on the odds board. What about the rest of the young guns? It's like this new wave. Victor Hovland, three straight weeks in a row uh, at the top of the leaderboard, leads the field in strokes gain, tee to green. Uh, you've got Matthew Wolf, the combo there from uh, Oklahoma State University. We mentioned Morikawa. Joaquin Neiman is another young kid on tour. Uh, would you be into backing in and and you mentioned Jordan Spieth. Jordan Spieth and Tiger are just a couple of the guys that I can think of that really started to win majors at a very young age. Can you get behind uh, some of these other younger guys uh, to you know take that next step as well? Maybe not immediately, Brady, but I don't think uh, too far off. And one of the things that you see in common with all those young guns that you mentioned, they all have a tendency to struggle a little bit with the putter. They're all yeah. very good ball strikers, but have have been kind of shaky around the greens and you know that short game is often the toughest part of the game really to master because so many of these guys can hit it a ton and they hit it straight and they hit good approach shots uh marikawa did it all last week at the uh workday uh event so uh i'm a big believer though in terms of major championships that more often than not you're just not going to win it on your first couple times, you kind of need to go through a little bit of pain before you get that first major. You kind of need to come close at least once or twice, you know, where you're in the hunt, but you can't get in the winner's circle. And there's still some really elite players that have kind of done that, that now it's kind of like we've went through the pain and when are we going to finally break through for that first major? John Rahm is a perfect example. Xander Schauffele, Patrick Cantlay, Tommy Fleetwood, Lord knows Ricky Fowler's had some close calls at, at major championships. So these guys, I think they got to go through maybe getting close one time to really understand that major championship pressure before they finally break through. Yeah, exactly right. They they need to kind of get used to that pressure cooker and what it is like coming down the stretch on a Sunday. Also, a lot of people have pointed to Ryder Cup and President's Cup competition as a good preparatory uh, measure for major championship victories because, again, you have a ton of pressure there playing for country. Uh, what about uh, any plays that uh, you have in pocket? I know you have Shoffley and Paul Casey uh, and DeChambeau. Humans has uh, Webb Simpson and Jordan Spieth. I have Spieth and DJ and also just added Sergio Garcia. Anybody that you've added uh, in the last week or considering getting down on for the PGA, Wes? 
Well, I'd surely uh, like to see, and I don't think he's going to drift up by much, but I would like to see Rory McIlroy get in the high teens. I don't expect that that's going to happen because he's more than likely going to stay the number one ranked player in the world unless Bryson DeChambeau wins about two or three more events going into the PGA, and then he's going to be the consensus number one. Uh, Rory obviously is one here at Harding Park. He won the WGC, so he's a guy I, I, I would like to play, but it's just you're going to have a really short number on this guy, and uh, I've got a good number on DeChambeau. Shambo. I wouldn't bet him uh, at this point, though, unless he gets to maybe 15 to 1 or higher, which uh, I'm not sure is going to happen. I think the drift has already happened, but I haven't really added very many guys. I probably was a little early on Paul Casey. I got him at 50 to 1. Now there's some 60s and maybe even some 66s out there. So uh, I haven't added anybody yet, but over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to be looking to see who might be able to strike and will be coming into form. Yeah, Rory's a good call. Maybe if he has a bad week this week, maybe if he has a bad week at the WGC, maybe he will drift up and you can get a 16 or 18 to 1, which would be a real nice price on Rory McIlroy. We'll get to all of our plays for the Memorial coming up next in our match play segment. It's Long Shots here on VEASAN and VEASAN.com, the sports betting network. Welcome back to Long Shots here at VEASAN and VEASAN.com, the sports betting network. Brady Cannon and Wes Reynolds with you. We'll bring in our colleague Matt Humans' plays as we get to the match play portion of the program, going over our plays for this week's event. And, of course, that is the Memorial, the second week in a row. We are at Mirfield Village, and we'll start with Mr. Humans' plays, Wes. He's going back to the well. The guy burned him, he, me and him both last week, Justin Thomas. Uh, last week he was uh, at about 13-1 to 1 down. Down to 12 to 1 is where Matt got him this week. Also going with Brooks Kepka, uh, kind of his weekly dose of Xander Schauffele, uh, looking at Abraham Answer, and then also Jason Day, who's been playing some pretty darn good golf, playing a lot of golf since the restart, and really kind of steadily improving. What do you think about going back to the well with Justin Thomas West? We talked about his mindset after kind of blowing it last week down the stretch. Can Thomas bounce back, and is that a play that you'd uh, agree with? It's not a play that I made, but I can't necessarily take a major stand or make a major argument against it because statistically, he's arguably the best fit and the best player in the field. When you look at the stats, he's ranked in second in strokes gained approach behind the man that nipped him in the playoff last week, Colin Marikawa. He's second in strokes gained tee to green. Uh, he's uh, top 15 in greens and regulation. And I think he's uh, eighth in the field, 11th overall in scrambling. I mean, you looked at last week, Justin Thomas, I think he rated like 38th in the field in putting and still had a three shot lead with three holes to play. So it's like maybe if he could just make one or two more putts that he can get there. Uh, Kepka is someone I considered. I left off. I did play him last week. Uh, interesting thing about Kepka, if he could just avoid the bad start. He was seven over on his front nines, on his first nine holes in both rounds combined on last Thursday and Friday, and was eight under on his back nines. So he's just got to avoid that. And and if he can, uh, and look, I've been feeling that he was coming into form, and we were talking in the last segment about PGA, and I know David Bierman mentioned it earlier, that might be a guy, if I could get him tw in the tw low 20s, that I would be looking to back. And then uh, I believe we do have a, you, Matt and I do have a couple common futures plays, so I will leave that to when it's my turn to go. Well, let me ask you about his matchup play, his head-to-head -head matchup. Again, these are for full tournament matchups. Uh, he's got John Rahm at minus 110 over Dustin Johnson. We know DJ is not one of Matt's favorites. He likes to fade DJ. Um, but do you expect a good week out of John Rahm, who really since the restart has been a little bit of a struggle? I do actually expect a good week out of John Rahm, and I also played that matchup. And uh, as you'll see momentarily, I made another play 
on on him this week. Uh, Rom is kind of the guy at the top of the market that's been getting ignored a little bit because look, we know Bryson's going to get action. We know Rory's going to get action. We know Justin Thomas is going to get bets. We know Morikawa is going to get bets. We know that uh, DJ, who won two weeks ago, he's going to get support. Cantlay is going to get support because he was the defending champion here at Muirfield Village last year. Fortunately, I was I was on him last year to cash a ticket. Hopefully, we can do two years in the row at the Memorial. But uh, Rom is kind of going to be a little bit of the forgotten man. And one thing about John Rom, uh, he shot 64. On Sunday, he kind of has been very pedestrian and not very good since the restart. But uh, And he only finished 27th, but he shot uh, 8 under 64, which matched the low round of the tournament last weekend at the Memorial. And uh, I think he gained like 6.2-something. I forget the exact uh, number, but it was around 6.2 strokes gained tee to green and over four shots gained on approach. Usually, Rahm and his ball striking gains more strokes off the tee. He's one of the best drivers of the golf ball when you combine not only distance but accuracy. He usually gains more off the tee than he does his second shots. But if he's hitting his second shots like that, he shot 64, not even really putting that great on Sunday. And his putting is above average for such an elite player. So, yeah, I'm, I'm very fond of John Rahm this week. All right. Well, let's get to your plays. You mentioned you had uh, a couple of different plays on John Rahm. Did you play him uh, on the outright futures board as well? I did at 22 to 1. Uh, I went ahead and. Uh, Took a shot with John Rahm, and uh, I was. We were joking. Um, actually, they joked after the segment with uh, Mitch and Paul on Follow the Money uh, on uh, Tuesday morning because they were ripping John Rahm. And then I said, uh, when they asked me who I liked, I said, "I'm going to go with a little bit of a quote unquote contrarian favorite." And Mitch <laughs> goes, "I'd have bet a thousand dollars he was going to say John Rahm," and sure enough, I did. So uh, John Rahm at 22 to one, I thought was a fair price. And it is a little bit of a boomer bust because he has not exactly gotten off the mat uh, very quickly uh, so far. So uh, John Rahm at 22 to one. I played Victor Hovland. I don't love it at 25 to one because he's the same price as he was in a weaker field last week. But He's led the field in strokes gained tee to green three consecutive events. That tells me that you're going to get a guy that's ready to win very soon. I almost get that feeling like I did with Bryson DeChambeau at Detroit where it's like eventually he's just going to win because he's playing so darn well. And, you know, leading the field in strokes gained tee to green. He was leading the field last week in strokes gained off the tee by about .4 strokes around over the next closest player. And also with six in the field for strokes gained approach, uh, progressively better form. He's losing less strokes on the green. He lost 1.4 strokes on the greens last week at Memorial. But before that, when you combine the Rocket Mortgage and the Travelers, he had lost 6.8 strokes combined. So at least the putting looks to be getting a little better. Uh, and then uh, I'll touch on a couple plays that Matt and I match on. And that was Abraham Answer and Jason Day. Uh, You'll recall less than a month ago, Brady, Abraham Answer shot 65 in the final round, 21 under par, and he loses because Webb yep. Simpson gets off with the butter and birdies five of the last seven holes to take the victory from him. And then after hey, that Wes, heartbreaking— real quick, real quick, you and I yes. talked about that. Was he going to be able to bounce back and get up off the mat, right? And, and he did pretty well in the following week, and then he took the next week off. I think that could be the perp uh, perfect recipe for answer. I'm on him as well. Uh, all the stats are there, and you can go into your explanation. But uh, I think the time might be right for what you and I had discussed before for him to get back up off the map. Yeah, I'm with you. He's kind of a little bit out of sight, out of mind this week. Uh, look, top 10 in, in approach and in T to green. Pretty good scrambler. He rates eighth on the PGA Tour. He's first-round leader here two years ago. I think getting that chance to recharge his batteries is probably the best thing for him. He's just outside the top 20 in the official world golf rankings. And look, last two memorials, we've had high-class breakthrough winners. It was Bryson DeChambeau two years ago, Patrick Cantlay last year, Morikawa last week at the workday. So uh, answer certainly fits that pattern. And then uh, Jason Day, because I think Matt played him as well, 
home game for him because he lives in nearby Westerville, Ohio, which is a northeast suburb of Columbus. Uh, spotty record in this event, but did finish very quietly uh, a top seven finish last week at the workday. He gained strokes in all five areas last week. Also has a win on a Nicholas design course at Glen Abbey for the Canadian Open a few years ago. Usually plays very solid at Augusta. So Jason Day is a guy I think could really surprise this week. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of Jason Day, and it's nice to see his game rounding into form. And I and I thought maybe a second straight week when he's close to home and he just gets that typical one week at Memorial, he's never done that well. Maybe two weeks in a row is a good recipe for this guy. We'll see how he goes. Uh, looking at my plays, I'm actually uh, on the opposite side with you on a head-to-head matchup, Wes. Um, I took Shane Lowry plus 105 over Corey Connors. Uh, you were on Connors minus the 125 over Lowry. I liked how Lowry played last week. He's also one of my futures plays at 145 to one. He faltered a little bit on the weekend, um, but I think this is a guy that give him a second go around. He showed a lot of signs uh, of playing really well. Good scrambler, does a lot well that I think you need at this course to win. Um, Corey Connors, for me, great ball striker, but the short game is his weakness. What was your mindset there on that matchup? Yeah, I basically it was kind of uh, uh, the do you choose the chicken or the egg here? And I chose the chicken in terms of uh, the ball striking with Corey Connors, where he's one of the best on the tour with the iron. But he's one of probably one of the more worst players with the flat stick. So, uh, you know, Lowry certainly if you combine the two guys, they'd be the perfect golfer. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, so Lowry uh, certainly is a capable player, but I just went with the ball striking with Corey Connors. I almost considered him as a future at 150 to one, but I went with another guy in that price range with uh, Danny Willett. All right. Well, let's uh, talk about one futures play that I uh, added this morning. My last futures play that I added was Hideki Matsuyama. And I think it's very interesting that David Bierman brought him up as a player he was going to fade this week because Hideki had the great rounds on Thursday and Friday and and then really just left it all for not on the weekend. Uh, Couldn't find the putting stroke. And that's what really led me to back him this week. You know it as well as anybody, Wes. Hideki putts great at Augusta, and that's the type of greens we're going to get this week. If Hideki would have had the putter working last week, he might have won the darn thing. He probably would have finished top 10. I think Hideki is in a perfect spot to back him. Maybe we're getting even a little bit better price because he was poor with the short game last week. I think he's one of those guys that we talk about that is better on a faster surface. Yeah, and you look up uh, the ball striking statistics every single week. He's the one of the best in the world. He was, uh, I think, sixth last week in the field in terms of uh, strokes gained tee to green and was uh, top 10 in strokes gained approach. So, yeah, that's always going to be the be the sticking point with Matsuyama is, is, is can he putt? And I was kind of going back and forth, and I left him off, and I just am figuring – You know, this is the week I'm going to leave him off, and this is the week he's going to show up. So I definitely don't disagree with that play. Well, uh, Sergio Garcia is uh, a play that you have at 80 to 1, which is a great number. I've seen him come down lower than that. And certainly, Sergio, one of the best ball strikers in the world, and uh, has a win at Augusta as well. So I'll root for you on that play. I know humans will not be, but uh, I I like uh, the thought of Sergio Garcia here at the Memorial as well. Next week is the 3M Open in Minnesota. Jeff Feinberg, professional better, professional golf handicapper, will join us to break it down. Thank you for joining us on long shots have a great week at the memorial you're on vsin and vsin.com the sports betting network